Um, well, it's nice to see all, all of your faces. Always nice. It's the only time I see very many faces, so hello. Uh, Enclave comes to you from, as Jean says, Showtown, um, <laughs> or the Puget Sound region, sometimes known as the Salish Sea. Jean and I conceived of it at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when it became apparent that we'd all be staying home most of the time. Of course, at that time, we thought that the pandemic would end and that, you know, we would only be trapped at home for a finite period. So we conceived of a finite series, that one that wouldn't go on and on. Um, that was back in March. Doesn't March seem like an eternity ago? Does to me. Um, but now here we find ourselves and it's still going on. But we have three more planned readings, and they are Lisa Walsack next week, uh, July 19th, Charles Bernstein, July 26th, and Jean and I will read on August 2nd. Then we'll um, either stop or have a, or take a hiatus. We haven't decided which. We're still considering that. But we'll get back to you, so stay tuned. Uh, today's reader, Joseph Donahue, will be introduced by Jean. Uh, Jean's recent books of poetry include Mood Indigo and Incapacity. Uh, Mood Indigo is from Selva Oscura, and Incapacity is from Chiasmus. And she's recently published two critical books, The Transmutation of Love and Avant-Garde Poetics from the University of Alabama, and Thinking and Writing Poetry, co-edited with Tyrone Williams out from the University of New Mexico Press. Jean is Professor of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington, Bothell. And here she is to introduce Joseph. Okay, well, thank you. And, and uh, thanks to Ray and thank you to Joe for being our reader today. And uh, Joseph Donahue's poetry books can be divided into those books that are in the Terra Lucida series and those books that are not in the series. Um, Joe published his first Terra Lucida book in 1998, and it has been followed by other books in the same series, sometimes bearing the title Terra Lucida, and other times having other titles dissolves uh, in, in this paradise. The work in these books dare happen happenstance with the sublime, the earthly with the metaphysical, such as in this line by Joe. Even at noon, the time is always night. The series also dares the separateness of distinct entities in its dissolves, as in a description of islands, ocean, and sky in his most recent book in this series, dark church. Here's Joe. Whatever islands these are, in whatever ocean this is, this expanse of glowing blue, one part smoother than any other, they reflect the sky that reflects the water. Joe declared the poets of the Terra Lucida series in his early volume, Monitions of the Approach. This is Joe. Uh, the words earth, fire, ocean, lightning change the speaker who chooses them. Then there, are, then there are his many other books of poetry with titles such as World Well Broken and Red and Flash on a Black Field, often with more apparently sociable voices and sets of preoccupations, although these two approach the moments of the dissolve. As in his most recent book, The Disappearance of Fate, I argue, this is Joe, I argue ecstasy is worse than pain. Any pleasure can wreck you, a compliment, a mild flirtation. Or in the poem, The Birth of structuralism based on a dream when Levi Strauss hands the poetic speaker 
tickets? Joe, take these tickets, he says. I have seen Brazil so much, I no longer need to go. In these books, Donahue's poetry is exuberant in its observed ironies and its poetics. And the poetics of these other books might be, all are changed by the tale they tell. As an overview of all of his books, I would say that Joe's work is a, quote, post-secular devotional poetry. These are Joe's words about another poet's work, but they are also descriptive of his own poetry. By post-secular, I do not mean that it is religious, but rather it dares the comfortable space of modern and postmodern literature in, its, in their secular celebration, as well as in their cynicism. It is post-secular in the ways that we are at a very different time now than the time of the long run of Western Enlightenment reason and Western liberal democracies, given the sheer power of the manifestation of diverse cultural, tribal, and religious affiliations in the US and over the globe. Joe's quote, post-secular devotional poetry is devotional in the ways that H.D. is devotional or Duncan in his later work is devo devotional or Lely Long Soldier is devotional or Nathaniel Mackey is devotional. It is devotional in that it manifests ardent, self-negating affection and dedication a respect for the myriad aspects of existence in all of its darkness and brilliance, abjection and loveliness. Before turning the event over to Joe, I would like to conclude on a personal note of appreciation to Joseph Donahue. I was fortunate to have had Joe as a colleague at the University of Washington and a compatriot in the alternative poetry scene in Seattle, namely in the Subtext Collective for several years in the 1990s. At this time, Joe's sense of poetry and life turned my head around. So many thanks to Joe for this. In many ways, he gave me writing. So Joe. I'd like to start, thank you, Jean, and thank you, Ray. Uh, this has been a wonderful series and it's uh, a, a deep pleasure to uh, participate in it. I wanna start with a poem um, by Jean Eyre from a book called First Mountain with, with a cover by James Reed. And uh, this is a book that I uh, co-translated with, with, uh, with Jean Eyre. Uh, this poem is called Burning Night Paper. Can love recall, can love remember itself? What time is it? Is this the moment? Stay up, keep your vigil through the night. Stay up, keep the hours, keep the memory snow. Thread, 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 entwine and tie and tangle me. Spindle, this is the night one thinks of the spindle, of a glossy black long braid of an oil lamp, of a daughter-in-law rushing to weave red cloth. For herself before her in-laws get up, the deeper realms are hidden in the overlapping maze of warp and woof. Love never wants to go back, except in a dream, which is now a pinch of tonight, a volume of darkness, of light, of an ash red bandana burning. What desires to be said? What desires to be written down? Burning, burning down so we can leisurely converse, so the full story can be told slowly. Burning, one stack, another stack. You no longer try to comb through the thread in front of you. Is it time? Entering the third watch, the vigil, deep in the night. Night, can it remember? Can it be remembered? 
like night itself, the embrace of the fire flickers in ev into every orifice. Caress the tended flame blazing with fulfillment. We stand up, we kneel down. Night, can it remember, can it be remembered? Red ash. That is a poem by Jean Eyre uh, from her book, First Mountain. I'd now like to read two uh, suites of poems from a book called Wind Maps. The first uh, suite I'm going to read is Wind Map 2. And it is something of an elegy for uh, a wonderful critic and friend, Catherine Lindbergh, who, who passed away in 2010. So this is Wind Map 2 for Catherine Lindbergh. Earth movers in the winter forest are stilled. No trace of a crew. Trickles fill the trenches of the reclamation project. Abandoned each twilight so that some magical animal might drink or some empty boat glide toward a budding shore. Where second thoughts an option, a prospective passenger might not board. Though a hat is on the seat in the boat to put on, an inky jar to sip, a biscuit to nibble, a wad of words that even unwrinkled is not intelligible until the pier drops out of sight. Flashlights sweep back, sweep back and forth over the rocks. During a snowstorm, your car is found on a bridge. This the last hour, your action can seem unbelievable. The final hope is a detective who says, you could be in a hospital and not know who you are. The biscuit is a black chunk smeared with butter by a crone in a coal bin. That morsel may be what the shore is. Islands and ice gliding by. I find I am stuffed with sawdust. My eyes are buttons. Pins stick me, so it seems in this dark. To think just last night I was an aspiring filmmaker. Turned out I had the wrong lens. In this time cycle, this 432,000 year long movie, this microsecond in a Mayhayuga, it seems the chance, Catherine, to get your take on the Czech surrealist, Jan Svankmeyer, who said dreams and childhood guide him and so all his films are political, that chance has moved on. Still, would you mind if I say you had not died? Can I say instead, you've gone down the rabbit hole? Yes, you answer. That's just how it is. I have gone down the rabbit hole and down in the dark of the rabbit hole, in the dark with Derrida, Sartre, Césaire, certain of the Black Panthers, and my husband, Murray Jackson, deep down the deepest rabbit hole. The world underwater is like an opera, the murk of a curtain not yet raised, an overture to Orpheus carries you away. A snowman crosses a bridge to parody of the scream, hand at side of face, sky coils of color above, blank face tipping right, small mouth, a ring of red floating in space as if shocked by the expanding blast from a supernova. The shadows of the earth fall across the moon. Red lunar light fills the air. A house found in a dream is made of plywood. A property so derelict, in a cop show, the police would just kick the walls and walk in. Oil smell, harbor water lapping and sloshing. On the sill of an open window, a creature roosts. At first, at first a feckless, Featherless seagull, bruise colored skin, broad head, blinded eyes. When I draw close and start to the window, it hisses and bites my hand, more like now a hammerhead shark sprung from the water, broad winged and settling in. On the floor, a bedroll, walls all smeared with writing. Days later, a TV update, the soul meanders after death. The screen fills with California's terraced hills. Due to a fiscal mishap of unsurpassable magnitude, all wineries 
are now ceded to the state prison system. Guards and criminals labor. Vast vineyards run up the slope of a mountain, glowing along the top with summer snow. Winds wake me, it's dark outside. A huge storm bears down. Gods and demons fight. Vishnu appears, a giant tortoise. Mount Mandara is spinning as it sinks. From the churning waters, treasures float up. Fourteen. The last is the nectar of immortality. Now and then the sun and the moon catch a demon sipping the nectar and cut off its head. Now and then a vengeful head reciprocates and gulps down the sun and moon. This back and forth is what eclipses are, is what the cadence of the cosmos will be until our ever returning creation tips back into the first ocean. A text says, the six elements composing all can be separately sensed in tonight's reddish light. Perhaps you do so now. Declared by those who declare officially missing, you may be feeling water at the forehead, fire at the throat, wind at the heart, earth at the navel, space at the edge of thought, awareness at the crotch, while your shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee, ankle, the zodiac, zodiacal houses make warring claims, all while the keenest cold is deep in your fingers. So much went into the water with you. What is left is no more than a shadow, a wisp, a cloud, a bubble. Here in the smallest of worlds, the middle one, the only one where liberation can be accomplished. Beside the boat floating, a woman, not you, on her back, eyes closed, hair fanned out, the water is black. She's in a deep sleep or in the midst of a meditation that brings all this to be. The river, the boat, and me seeing her oars pulled in as she drifts close, her thin gown is indistinguishable from the slight shine water winds when a ripple crosses it. I envy such rest. Leaning close, I look long. The water is not black, but green and light-filled. Incredibly, beneath the boat, a second woman is floating upright, awake. She is standing on the fountaining tip of some surge of deep, spear in hand. She breathes water. Her robes flutters, her robe flutters. This is for her, this possible goddess, an amusement. When she sees me, seeing her, she flings the spear with great force. The spear pierces the floor of the boat, impales me, flashes into my innards, tears gut and stomach, twists into and through my heart, shoots into my shoulder, edges through my neck and out and up, and seems to be borne away by a bird. Air is a strange, meager medium. Earth is a mundane matter. The middle imperium liquid is where hope might gleam, is where nectar dwells. From this milk, all rises. Into it, all drops back. Within such welling is the one place where anything that could be called real can happen. Liquidity pours, liquidity transforms, but also liquidity steals all. It takes everything from us and everyone. So many we will never see again. Uh, the second suite I would like to do from Wind Maps. It's number five. Where is it? And it has an epigram where it listeth. Your new job is night after night at the sleep disorder clinic to go room to room taping electrodes to the heads of the, of the restless and the desperate. 
Now might night give a garment, a shirt of gold mesh, dense and fine, a weave of porous metal. Slipping it on, one would be the very midst of all glitter. A spell in its cling, it feels like a healing fire writhing without heat. Fire is seeping into you, passing through you, knowledge of sorts, as if a glowing script could be what the micro lengths most truly were. Pain is pulled from you, pangs and aches leave you. Havoc of nerve ends, that blade thrust in your shoulder, that agony down your arm is lifted away, as if a new body were gathering within the gold. Simple motions, now pure delight. You can look to either side, you can look up into the dome of the night sky, a bluish light, like a delicate web of electricity, like the initial ripple of a gas fire. You can turn freely to the left, to the right. You can move your arms, palms to the sky in thanks to the night that bequeaths to you, undeserving though you are. If not a body of light, a body becoming a kind of light, or if not that, a sensuous vestment, or at least a shirt, a lit rag to you, where you lie cold, alone, and in pain. Minor Lives. Sent then to the South Pole with helium to fill a huge balloon on a mountaintop, launch it into the day long day, into the only pure and quiet air left in our world to record what is passing away. Gust after gust, gifts are sent down. The trees bend flat un until some further courtier of wind lifts each invisible offering away. Treasures born further inland as into the interior of a palace. What other cities ever drew such desire from the heart of the ocean? Baghdad, Granada, Damascus, Jerusalem, Beirut, Paris? A woman has been reading about waves listening actually when she can't sleep to recordings of great currents only found in deadly oceans where so often come to rest less than newsworthy low-lying foreign tankers said to sink in under a minute this the time of year the weather trends toward transmutation a Californian might recall the terrestrial ecstasies of 1989, kids pulling bodies from freeway cars. You stayed a night too many. Your host would never say anything, but it may be time to leave and step into the storm. Surfers idle, eye on horizon, a chopper drops them mid-sea. Manhattan across the water, flowing light. Blessed then to have that job desk by a window, a whole room of adjuncts, men and women hanging on at the mercy of a market. Hoboken has sunk into the sea many times. Hoboken will return. We will not recognize it, Murat said, though we find we know it intimately. Finally, a wind rises into which anything can be said because no one will ever hear it. Dream. The street number was right, but the street was wrong. Not a spa with its own beach, but an empty lot. Bulky black trash bags set curbside. Never quite clear what canto anyone is in. Never quite clear who the guide is. My ear tuned to the pure song of heaven, to the sub-vocal moan where hell is happening, to the digressions of purgatory where each utterance is a spiraling climb of asides. Addled in once leafy reaches by insects and the sap bled by that devouring having long run down the trunk, crystallizing a perfect conduit. The day the tornado tore up the neighborhood, the pine tree drawing down lightning to itself exploded. 
Flaming chunks flew up into the spiraling heights passing over the earth. Part parable scatter, part GMO, such seeds as are sown and such as a light in a declivity once dubbed the palm of God, flung by the wayside, upon stony places or among thorns, of the three ranks of the created, so asks the handful you seem to be scattered among, which are we? Perhaps by the wayside, where to be redeemed would be to be eaten, excreted, by be finally soteriological scat, shat out beyond the grounds of glory's crop, be fluted blooms of light, earth's iridescence. But why do we have to do all this boring homework? Why aren't we born knowing answers already, the boy had asked. Clouds moved in the next day, on the night wind a new perspective, although what, what that might be soon became the vanishing point of every thought. All flowed over that question, into it, through it, out the other side of it, so that the question seemed like the original stream that made where this is, Hope Valley, where, if shrieks could be a kind of bird, a flock of them just landed. If resentment could be a flurry of squirrels, high branches spring with the touch of tiny feet. The night sky all gold with angels, the prophet's face a white blur of light, a flying horse with a human head, as if Muhammad will never come back. The boy with the fundamental question then took on the demeanor of a dervish, asking, why am I then obligated to heaven that although it has given me a soul, has also created within me the sorrows from which the soul suffers? This and other inquiries, some such as pursued in apocalyptic pamphlets on a table at Port Authority, or through illustrations in the clutch of a deadbeat riding the Hoboken train, a comet called New Mutant. But let me say to you what the psychic told the Countess. An influx of divine intelligence can be disorienting. A snowstorm is coming. Manhattan will disappear. A wall of white drops into the river, becomes a frozen rock face. Someone climbs it and is gone. The rock face is a dissolving ladder of solid liquid and mist. Just thinking of it makes you one with the air. From the hand of the sower, the scattering goes on, such seeds as we are, picked up by an overwhelming wind all the way from ancient Egypt, where a nine to five job runs through the night. There were watchmen in ancient Egypt like you, but without the dials, the thermometer, the anti-contamination protocols, who also guarded the heart through the night, the surgically removed heart, kept in this instance viable till the sun comes up and the transplant team arrives. A day that by its closing will bring further hearts, livers, eyes to the stricken, and an entourage of heads to the medical school, possibly the heads of solipsists, those phosphorescent neural arcades, alumni possibly of sex parties lasting days on end, sated and spent, they drop into deepest sleep having wandered down to the dock where the sun laments the rivers falling away into black. Even among the thorns, Paradise passed through each of them several times a day. Nothing can keep it from them. Even in the archive of the egregious, which is to say your office, a drop of thought finds you. Sweetness sneaks you out. After dark, after work, walking home, gin, bottles in your, gin bottle in your hand, a well-dressed young woman calls out from a warehouse stoop. It's a shame no one is drinking that. The two of you swap slugs. The bottle is huge. Every swig a tide turns within it. The incoming ripple startles your new friend. 
She spills some down her chin, wipes it off quick while marveling how good it is. This is only what every ocean should be, she exclaims. Moreover, this is what the night already is, she further reflects, an intoxicant impossible to abuse, a, a buzz one can glory in and never regret, a bliss from which I never awake sorry, sordid, and sick the next day. Um, I'd like now to move to some poems from uh, this most recent book, Disappearance of Fate, which has a marvelous cover by the painter Bonnie Melton. And I'd like to start here with the first pages of the longer poem in the book uh, called uh, in, in an Orchard at Night. And this has an epigram from a Arab theologian, uh, Kushari, who was uh, 10th century, who wrote the, a book called The Epistle on Sufism, which I believe this quote's from. Uh, the, quote, the epigram is, during the night that they are veiled, they observe sudden glimmerings that take them by surprise. The earth has never been more than a cloud. And by a dry stream bed below a gold hill, such states of being as a drunk or an ascetic feels or would feel. Another night, why did the light mean more than the shadows? One possible answer so that this could be the book of flashes. Another night, you too had risen to where these ephemeral happenings are continuous or having stayed put, just stayed as you were. Let your heart become a shroud. A young man in a blue coat just went out, just went out your door, stepping over a pile of your bottles, books, and unopened bills. Isn't he, in some presumably ongoing life, your son? Back and forth, too quick to fathom, the salamander dazzles the dog. Another night, the canal water was so black, it could hardly mirror the flames of the floating bowls of burning oil. The flames seemed to lie on the water for a moment, then sink. Another night, thunder so monumental you could not miss it, or the blinding blank breaking across her sleep, across enfolding a dress on a hanger hung from the top of a door, the dry cleaner plastic trembled. Another night over the black wash of the trees, a full moon hazy, the tasty shade of an apricot. Another night round midnight, a helicopter swept low, descending to the hospital. Another night to the abiding presence of what else were we so blind on any day? The decree of a dream so utterly forgotten is, no detail shall ever be swept back to the alien domain of waking. As when, in the midst of a Moravian love feast, the color of the ribbon our bonnets on our bonnets announced to all whether or not we would entertain a suitor. Another night, the poetic image is a portal, a friend said. Look through it. What do you see on the other side? Are there trees? What is the sky like? Do the people have faces or are they all wearing masks? Grass so dry, it's turning white. At dawn, the yard looks like an astonishing frost. Another night, a dream, a clay statue handed to you, a whirling inside it. You can feel it pass, pour deep into your hands, into the bones of your hands, as if your daughter allowed you with this gift to feel at last some first force to marvel at the depth of the red in the clay, the flicker of orange and red within it, as if drawn into the shaping of it from the ridges and ravines all around and sunk within the clay. Now and then a wave, a rift, a shadow, a tree, a branch, a blossom, a sliver of bluish red that has darkened 
but all the light in the sky still bends toward it. Another night, a river dropped into a desert. Hundreds of miles away, the wells in the village begin filling. Another night, a woman in a blue-green chemise, the shade distance would shine within a Japanese print, was saying, I emerged from a gold mine deep below the water table. We rode down harrowing passages in utter blackness, knowing the walls had once been coral reefs and that the chief cause of death in this mine is drowning. The sides of the shuttle train scraped the walls. The driver had the only light. Now and then we passed a lone miner deep in his own tunnel, flat out with a lamp in mud, clawing mud as black as a black snake on a black road, though at night moonlight tends to make its skin glisten as it glides. Another night, night after the night of the costume party, crepe, streamers, wands, masks on the floor, silver glittering confetti, all were still there, but the room so empty as if later that evening, in the midst of the fun, all those there were swept off the planet. A book, like a boat, like a bird, like a book, like a cocked box to float away in, looking up in a depth of pure inundation at the stars. Last night, at last, the last night, the sky overhead at once emerald and purple and a glowing black as if there were gold beneath the black, as if to look up into it all at this exact moment placed you, as the philosopher might say, in the totality of the sphere of one's heaven. Um, down here. I'd like to uh, read a few shorter poems from uh, uh, that all have the same title, uh, without rent or seam. And where are we talking? and then maybe one or two others. And these are again from Disappearance of Fate. Without rent or seam, the memoirs of the renowned physicist astonished the world, reaching even readers on sailboats deep in the lakes, gray green as in a forest, leaves flickering or still as the wind wills, ruffling even the needles of an Arctic spruce from 35,000 years ago. He calls earth a heaven without rent or seam. without rent or seam. A heap of cinder block at sunset. The derelict mall is now other than what thought can bring about. Soon this dusty basement will be the primordial canopy where the last bird delight. Soon universal forces will concentrate in Jane, seen by chance on local TV an inadvertent extra on the street, as beautiful now as years back at her wedding, when the water rose over the pier, then dropped so low that by evening the river had disappeared. Without rent or seam, this is kind of a bit of a, the psychic topography of my hometown, Lowell, Massachusetts. <clears throat> Later in life, he just sat home on the Sabbath, setting off explosives in his backyard until the cops showed up. Though raised Catholic, he would say, I never got when to kiss the ring. Finally, he slipped away as if down the river Thoreau sailed, red, brown, peach, copper, 
silver on the tree-lined water, the flow as garish as the fence around the temple on the bluff by the waterfall, a derelict estate bought by a volcano cult. Believers wed on the seething rim, birthed their kids over fumes, dropped their dead into the pulsating interior. This, their last spiritual home, found them sadly distant from the geothermal infernos that were the truth of their ritual life. Without rent or seam. Little of your day to day is enviable. Yet you prefer not to die only seeing the hell of it all, only glorying in the many mirrors of your own mayhem. A dead stag with white granite chips for eyes seems about to speak with a warmth often denied the unaddicted, but then an envelope full of the ashes of other envelopes is in your hand. You put it down just a second, and now it has mingled with shadows and can't be found. And let's see. Uh, this po next poem is, where is it? This next poem is dedicated to the poet Simon Pettit. It's called Periphery Dance Hall. The proximity of a planetary pole can be felt inside luxurious hotels in any number of Nordic lands. I'm here for the holiday pageant at the firehouse at the edge of town on an expanse that could be called a prairie, but for craters and ice flows. The parking lot is empty. A white bird flies out of, a black sm out, out of black smoke. The chunk of gray ice is the sky. Pinwheels of light slowly turning inside a head. Social integration seems easier here, yet no one has ever known you less well. How silently the rain came and went in the night. This is what for you, for now, is the beyond, a sky falling into the street. Yesterday, a hint hurt me. An intimation left me perplexed. Dropping the camera again might just fix it. The blur makes us all seem energetic, about to abandon our bodies. In this hotel, Discredited ideas, cleansed of apparent purpose, are highly prized. And nothing can break the new lock on the door. Shoot it with a gun, it won't open. Any intruder will have to split the door open with an ax. The runoff seems to weave itself. The lip of a waterfall shines above the black. In an 1825 painting by John Martin, Sadak is looking for a sip of oblivion. But winter is the well we all fall into. Torch-bearing children singing on a hillside. A flock of belled goats is released. Such joy as if your brothers and your sister are talking in the next room. Snow streaks the forest floor. Let a wounded face be the final icon. Last night, you were inside a mobile home speeding down a highway. It was dark and quiet. The bed had fresh linen on it. You were anticipating a restful sleep, though there was also this sensation of shooting through space. It felt precarious. An intermittent sideways wind made the room waver. And I will conclude with uh, a short poem called Cape Verde where I've never been. Sometimes I think horses are immortal 
and that I live in a barn on Mount Olympus, that my body is pure mind, and minds are dreams whirling within a derelict infinity. Last night, for example, I had sex with a powerful partner. I, too, was neither man nor woman. Under the billowy satin, we both explored our mutual dearth of genitalia. I awoke as happy as after a great ravishment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, applause uh, to you. It was wonderful. Let me uh, get ready to come back and bid adieu. It was a fabulous reading. Uh, many wonderful fables and fabulous words. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Ray. Thank you all. Thank you, Joseph. It was great to hear you. Just, all right. So with, with this, um, we all say adieu. Thank you all for coming to Enclave. Same time, same place. Uh, next week, come here, Lissa Walsack. Again, many thanks, Joe, for a wonderful reading. Thank you.